my name is Jason Robinson, and I am primarily an architect. It's what I've done professionally for the last 14 years. I work for the oldest continually operating firm in the country and do many types or typologies, as we call them, of buildings. So I've worked on healthcare, corporate headquarters, uh, engineering lab buildings, you name it. I've kind of got a broad experience there. Photography is probably my second uh, highest passion, and I've been very fortunate to be able to pursue that. I am a maker, so I love to do woodworking and craft-based kind of things, including working with steel. I'm avid outdoorsman, maybe not a fisherman, but I love to hike and bike and walk around a city, even love yard work. Uh, I'm into technology, and I love philosophy, reading, comedy, and uh, YouTube is a thing that I do when I want to learn something. So for all of you, if you ever need a resource for learning how to do photography, there's probably a million and one ways to watch it on YouTube. And I think it started, I'd like to say that I loved photography my whole entire life and that I've carried it on continually, but that's not the case. I, uh, although you can't really tell, am the one on the right side of this image. My dad uh, did photography. And in fact, when we would go on vacations when I was younger, he was essentially the dude that had at least a still camera, but also probably a camcorder, if not both. And so he wasn't always in the photos that he had, but he always took the photos. And I think somewhere along the lines in this little young guy right here who really admired and looked up to his dad, um, I think photography became an interest of mine by proxy. And I, my first purchase ever, my first big purchase that I can remember is this guy right here. I'm going to try and show you all. This is a little red Rico camera that I got from Ritz camera and I was below 10 years old. And, uh, you know, I thought I was going to be a mini photographer at the time. Well, like a lot of kids, I kind of lost interest quickly with that and put down photography for a long time. Fast forward to college and I started, I had to take an elective. I had well, many electives and one of them was photography. This was film photography at the time. My father uh, had a dark room in his house, so we had an enlarger. He had film cameras and all that kind of stuff. And so that was something we could talk about. I was interested in, thought I'd take it and kind of maybe re-spark a flame that I had. And I, I went through college, did a little bit of photography here and there, got into the working world. And this is my first architectural photograph. Now I promise the rest of the photographs come going forward will be of a higher caliber than this. But I wanted to show this because I do not have an inherent ability to be able to see things. I do not have a gift for photography. Everything that I have is a practice craft. I spend a lot of time in the things that I do. And in fact, when I was younger, I would do rabbit hole dives. I would go through and find a subject that I was interested in and just pursue it to its depths. I would eat, you know, sleep and breathe this stuff. I'd eventually kind of come out of that and I'd find a new interest to go into. And photography has been, uh, you know, just an extension of that kind of learning process. So this was at the uh, Detroit Zoo in Royal Oak, Michigan. This was, I was asked to go out here. I had just gotten a job in an architectural industry and uh, hey, you have a camera. You want to go out and take a couple photos. Our paid, you know, photographer didn't capture all the stuff we needed to see. Well, fast forward my first year in uh, the working world, I had enough scratch and a friend that decided uh, he wanted to go to Italy and was looking for somebody to take a trip with. And after some deliberation and uh, some wise words from a friend that said, you'll always make more money, I decided to book a ticket. And we did it in advance, which gave me enough time to kind of marinate on the fact that, hey, I'm going across the pond. Who knows when I'll be there again? Maybe I should have a good camera. And as my dad and I talked, he's like, do you really want to do the film thing going over there? I have traveled and I know that life and it's tough. You don't know if you're getting the right exposures. You're dealing with a lot of canisters, et cetera. Ultimately, uh, I decided that I would make my first big purchase uh, as a working man or second big purchase really, but was a Canon EOS 40D digital SLR. I got that in a kit lens for like 1800 bucks. DSLRs were pretty new at the time within a few years, at least in mainstream commercial um, kind of or consumption uh, machines. And away we went. And, you know, right when the time 
came for the trip to Italy, I found this place called lensrentals.com and they had very reasonable rates and I rented some lenses so that I could expand the uh, capabilities of what I had bought knowing that 1800 bucks didn't get you much in that world. This was taken with one of those um, rented lenses. This is like a 10 to 17 millimeter zoom lens. And um, this is the Vatican staircase. One of the things or a couple of the things that Italy has, they have staircases and they have ceilings, right? Those are everywhere you go. I, they have a lot of things, not just staircases and ceilings, but you could make an entire career out of visiting places and just photographing that stuff. It's absolutely amazing. And I still was just fumbling around with photography, but it seems like I got lucky or the context was so nice. You could really hardly screw up a shot. Now, I might not be giving myself enough credit, but at the same time, I was very much still fumbling around with photography. This is on top of the Duomo in Florence or Firenze as they refer to it in Italy. There is a book called Brunelleschi's Dome, which if you have any inclination into seeing how things are built, a fascinating short read about how they built this dome out of masonry units in a time when they didn't have the technology that we have today. It's absolutely mind boggling the precision in which they built this. It's a beautiful city. I got done with that trip and back in Detroit where uh, the firm I work for is headquartered. I work down there every day and I would experiment with stuff. And this is a street scene from by a parking deck that I used to park at. And this is really the steam coming up from all of the, the lines, all the manholes and just blowing up and kind of creating this image where you can't really see through it. It was a deep scene without much depth at all, if that makes sense, but still very much experimenting. My next year, I went to San Francisco. This was in 2008 when we had the financial crisis and my job was saved by getting transferred over to another component or another office in our firm for a couple months stay while our office was slow. San Francisco is an amazing city. If you haven't been there, completely worth going to. Just make sure you have layers because even in summer, it can get cold and in the winter, it can get warm. You turn a corner and it seems like the weather changes. And I think in San Francisco, I was really experimenting with relationships of things. Here, you can see it as the relationship of this fence to the, the tower behind it. But then also in a more global sense, you're in San Francisco, which has an amazing bit of architecture and kind of human inhabitation, but it's on the edge of nothing, right? And just going to the edge of the city, you get to see things like this. These are called seal rocks, I believe. I think I, there was a comment somewhere. I'm going to hold on that because I cannot find it. I came back from San Francisco and was doing more experimenting. This time is just a, a shot I'll show you that is intentionally not focusing on the right subjects, just a series of Christmas lights and how you can take something so simple and turn it into something kind of abstract and cool just by, you know, being uh, intentional about screwing up the image. My next trip, I had met this guy uh, at work and he was from Brazil, told me he was going home to visit his family. And I said, when are we going? He actually jokes about that years later about how I invited myself uh, to his family get together. This is a German restaurant in Brazil. And really Brazil to me was about feeling. I was immersed in a culture. I didn't speak the language whatsoever. Luckily I was there with a friend and a family that really uh, supported, you know, and, and kept me safe, but an absolutely amazing place. And I went to a part of Brazil that is on the equator. It's called Fortaleza, beautiful beaches nearby. Uh, did actually a bit of exploring there, but again, honing my photography the entire time, just practicing. But still, I would say not a guided practice, just really just doing it. And then I got back to Detroit and I was still doing more experimentation. Now, this is a simple idea that you can do. Uh, anybody can do with a tripod and a zoom lens. This is just a long exposure shot that you take the picture, you let it sit for, let's say it's a 10 second exposure, you let it sit for a couple seconds and then you just twist the zoom ring, right? Something very super simple, but these are the kind of experiments I was doing, just kind of pushing the boundary of what I knew. And then in 2012, uh, something happened and it was burnout. I had been working at an architectural firm and working really, really hard trying to hone my craft. We're talking months of 80 hour weeks at a time. 
there was actually a point where um, I was driving to work on a day off with my mind so preoccupied that I hit a puddle going way too fast on the freeway, jumped on top of the median, almost. It was like the uh, General Lee in Dukes of Hazard when it pauses and then Uncle Jesse comes on and narrates. There was that moment when I thought I was going into the opposite lane of traffic. Luckily came back down on the side of the car, hit the tires, shot four lanes across the freeway, totaled my car, turned it into just a crumpled mess. Luckily, I walked out of there without a scratch. I think it was time for me to kind of reevaluate some things and take a break. And I'll tell you the one thing that photography has done for me over anything else is taught me how to get out of my head and look around. Like in architecture, I always trained to look at the context in the past and see the possibilities in the future. And you spend a lot of time in your head checking scenarios and thinking through all of those things. And it got to a point in my life where I'd go from point A to point B, let's say in a car, a drive that I'd take five days a week, and I wouldn't forget any, or I wouldn't remember any of the details from the drive. I was in my head. I paid the price for that once and I started coming out of it. But what photography has allowed me to do or trained me to do is shut my mind up and open my senses. Because if you can't see, if you can't kind of get out of your own head, you'll never take a good photograph. You'll never see what's around you. You'll never look at the relationships and you'll never understand when to be patient and how to time things. So 2012, I burned out. I did the only sensible thing that I thought I could do, which was I had three months of paid time off stacked up. I told my bosses, well, I kind of said, this is the thing. I'm either going to leave or I'm going to take all three months at the same time, add two additional months and take a five month sabbatical. Since I had done, I guess, pretty well at the firm, they allowed me to do that and keep my seniority. And now I had five months of time to do whatever it is that I was going to do. I had the itch of traveling from going to the last three locations, Brazil, San Francisco, and Italy. But this time I wanted to do it decidedly different, which was be autonomous by myself, travel a land that I knew the language, have a vehicle where I could control the experience. And so I decided that I would take a road trip across the country. I'd go national park hopping, right? And I'd visit my best friend who the person I just went to Brazil with had moved to Washington state. So when doing that, I started a business because why not reward yourself with a tax break is what I thought at the time of buying all this equipment. I just decided I would do that. I spent $10,000 on a new camera and a couple lenses and started a business. Didn't know how it would ever work out. Didn't know if I'd make a dime, but that was the thing. Then of course I went to REI, became their best customer for a little while and spent a premium on super ultralight camping gear. Cause in my mind, I was going to hike 70 miles all by myself out into the middle of nowhere, do this thing, eat raw meat, who knows what I was thinking at the time, but I spent a lot of money doing that. Well, I started planning for this trip and I realized that I'm going to plan five months and I'll never go anywhere. So on a Sunday morning, I decided this was it, I'm doing it. And I packed it all up and by Sunday afternoon, I hit the road. Traveling from Michigan West is kind of an interesting thing or it's very interesting because the terrain and the landscape change so subtly over time. You start in Michigan and it's really flat with trees. You get out past Chicago, it starts to turn flat but without as many trees. You get to the Missouri River and there's this big, big break in the earth where there's like a rock ledge. You start to get into Iowa, you're in rolling hill corn territory. And then all of a sudden you get here, which is in South Dakota and the Badlands. And the earth just falls apart. There's basically high plains, low plains, and all of these striated rock formations that mediate the two. Old seabed, I believe, something like that. And this place you could explore with your eyes forever. And it's really cool in a way because a lot of it is very visually accessible from the road. You don't have to hike five miles to see anything. You can pull off at a roadside stop and hang out for a few hours and just daydream. It's also filled with a lot of, uh, you know, these kind of hard edged rocks that we saw in color before, but also these sunflower fields. Right, so a lot of soft and rolliness as well in the Badlands. There's a lot of bison 
And if you don't look out, there's also a lot of uh, bison left behind. Sorry for the graphic photo. Well, my first night uh, in the Badlands was interesting because I had only set up my camp, uh, my tent twice prior to this. The first time uh, was in soft Michigan soil. The second time was in Iowa, and that was again in soft soil. And I got here. And this place captivated me so much that I was out until two o'clock in the morning doing stuff like this. Now, I'd never taken a photograph of the stars at night, and this has got a million problems wrong with it. But I stayed there for hours and hours and hours just trying to figure out how to capture this thing. Well, I was an idiot and I didn't set up my tent. So at about two in the morning, after I had done this and I'm exhausted, I decided to go to the campground, which is in the Badlands, set up my tent and go to bed. Now I'm chasing sunlight, so there's not a lot of time between this is in the summer, not a lot of time between going to bed and waking up for the sun coming up. I uh, went out, I got my tent all built. I threw all of my ultralight stuff in there, right? I got about $2,000 worth of camping gear and I'm ready to stake the tent. And I go to push the stake in and guess what? Oh, it's not soft soil. And guess what I didn't do in my haste to get out of uh, my home? Was pack a hammer. Totally an inexperienced camper by any stretch of the imagination. I didn't have anything to pound the damn stake into the ground. So smart me, I start looking around. It's two in the morning. I don't want to wake people up. I'm trying to be resourceful. I don't want to bang on things. Couldn't find a rock anyways. I found a bottle cap for a bottle of water. I thought, oh man, you know what? That bottle cap will work. I'll just put it right in the palm of my hand and I'll press. It'll be strong enough. Well, wouldn't you know it? I hear a pop. The stake goes through the bottle cap, which goes into my hand. Now, it wasn't like through the other side by any stretch of the imagination, but it definitely went in and punctured skin. I started bleeding everywhere. That was a calm night, speaking weather-wise. It was clear outside. It was absolutely gorgeous. No wind, no none of that. So I find the, the bathroom in the facility, and I go there, and I start washing my hands. And wouldn't you know it? The second I started washing my hands, I heard a sound I hadn't heard that night. Wind from out of nowhere. My ultralight kit with $2,000 basically of stuff in it is sitting out there. I freak out like, oh no, it's not staked down. I turn off the water, grab some paper towel, dry my hands, and I make it out to the campsite. Well, where is my campsite? I don't know. The reason why I don't know is because the tent's not there anymore. I'm looking around with my headlamp. I can't find it. So I get my super, you know, like 18,000 lumen, really nice flashlight. And, psh, and all of a sudden I see it as this high tech, super expensive tumbleweed just rotating and blowing away. And it was in this tall grass section that if it's daytime out and you can read the signs, they say, don't go in this grass. Rattlesnakes love to play here. You're in danger if you walk through this grass. That's where my tent is. I don't care, man. I'm just starting this trip. I'm going after the tent. So I sprint. I run, I run, I run, I run. I finally catch up to this thing and I'm just, I don't want to break it down. So I just grab the tent and I try to drag it back. Well, guess what? It's like a sail and it's making noise. People are trying to sleep and it's, you know, just making a ruckus. So right there in the tall grass, I broke down the damn tent as easily as I could grabbed onto it like a bear hug, walked over to my car, got there, unlocked the door, threw it in the back seat got in my passenger seat, reclined it, and went to bed. Total, total fail. Well, the next night, I, I wised up and I asked for a hammer, set my tent up during the day, and that night, I got to sleep in a rain flyless tent, looking up at the stars to the Aeneid meteor shower, which was like 90 meteors an hour, and I can't tell you how epic that was. It was quite the contrast and, and very pleasant. So the Badlands, this is on my way out. They're a beautiful landscape of plateaus, of different rock formations, of all sorts of things. And the light can be really, really amazing. Normally, it's not the best idea to look into harsh light to take it. But for this series, it seemed to work for me. From there, and I'm going to miss a whole bunch of stuff. But, uh, you know, I went through the Black Hills, the Earth then. So as you're going from the Badlands, you're heading west then the earth starts getting a little bit more crazy. And you come across a place like this in Wyoming called Devil's Tower. 
there's a long story and I can't say that I'm super rehearsed behind this, but the Native Americans essentially believe that there were either two baby bears or two children, and I forget, that were in trouble. They've got pushed up on this rock monolith by their God and a bear, a giant bear tried to get them and put all of these uh, flutes or striations in it. It's, I think, 1,200 or so feet tall. And it's pretty vertical at most of the points. It's pretty crazy when you see it in context. If you get up and you see it at the right time of the day, it's absolutely beautiful. It's very geometric. It's very cut. It looks like almost, I don't know, it's pretty amazing. And what's funny is, is you can approach this thing from all sorts of different angles. And as I was doing this, I, I heard these weird noises. It sounded like people screaming, but not like in a terrified way. And it was really a high volume you could tell at the source, but by the time it got to me, it was a little bit muffled, but it seemed too clear for somebody to be standing on the ground. Well, what's really funny about that is this place is known for climbers to come to, and I had no idea. So if you look close enough on this picture, now this is only a 24 megapixel camera, you can see these two people climbing the crack without any protective equipment. Absolutely nuts. And these people happen to be from Argentina, for whatever reason. And then when they get up to the top, a lot of them parasail down, which is, is crazy. From there, I went to uh, Yellowstone, right, which is a, a great place. This is Mono Lake, I believe it's called. It's the caldera, the big lake in the middle of it all. Uh, every morning, it seemed to be like this, just steam rising off of it. I was 100 feet from this image. You know, my, my tent was set up that way. And when you get to Yellowstone, not only has the earth by now started to completely just change, you're going through really rugged terrain and big mountains getting by the continental divide. You're also seeing an abundance of wildlife. This is me sitting at a bench right outside of my tent with a 105 millimeter lens. So not a very uh, zoomy type of lens. And there is no crop in this image. There were probably 16 of these all within a very close distance. One morning, in fact, I uh, woke up to the kind of like vibrated thumps of a noise that was really close to me and it turned out to be a bison just grazing the guy wire on my tent. I walked around a corner and saw this thing. Now I am standing up, I'm not kneeling. This thing's head is almost eye level with me. The rack on this was absolutely insane. And it snorted at me. I took off. I got scared. It, it, it won its battle. And of course, the bison. Right now, when you go to a place like Yellowstone, you're going to notice bear jams and bison jams, which is essentially where everybody thinks they're a National Geographic photographer, they see an animal, they stop their car in an extreme fashion, get out and try to run after that animal and take that photo. I tried to be more respectful of that, but you know, to say that I didn't do that every once in a while is probably a lie. But also in the same park, they have what I would consider the smelliest place on earth. And that's not a casino dumpster in Vegas. That's uh, the geyser area, right? So where they have all of the hot springs and all of that stuff. Anything that looks like this, I'm telling you, doesn't smell good. And if you haven't learned it after all of your years, I'm sure, you know, make a trip there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, but absolutely smelly. It's something that no photograph has ever communicated to any one of us. If you're at Yellowstone, take 45 minutes south and go to the Grand Tetons. They're absolutely amazing. And Jackson Hole is a city which is right outside the Tetons probably has more PhD graduated coffee baristas than you could ever imagine. It's a place where a lot of people love to go because it's beautiful scenery. The skiing's nice, you know, kind of a cool place. It's here uh, that I learned when, what my limits were, essentially. I went on a hike very naively still uh, and got to the last of my water and food reserves and realized that I hadn't turned around yet. This was about a half a day hike. And I had half a day coming back. By the time I got back, I was a different human for a few hours. I got to my trunk, had the sense about me to drink a whole entire gallon of water and had to literally sit in my car for about an hour as I recuperated, maybe an hour and a half. I was heavily dehydrated. It was a good lesson because I didn't uh, suffer something more serious, I guess. 
And then I went, this is tied for my favorite national park. I went north into Montana, big sky country. I went to Glacier National Park. And this place is epic. It is amazing. There is a road that you drive through the entire valley called Going to the Sun Road. Very appropriate for this picture. You essentially start at low elevations. You drive up to the pass in the middle, which has a welcome center, and then you decline on either side of that thing. I arrived in late August. It was snowing. Uh, it was just a brief snowstorm. It wasn't enough to cover anything. But uh, an absolutely amazing, amazing place to be. Of course, the glaciers are receding and diminishing and all this stuff, um, but it's still one of the most amazing places on earth. And this is, you can see the cut of going to the Sun Road. When they finally clear this road, which I think is in late May, they can get up to like, I don't know, 20 feet or more of snow that they're clearing off of this road. It's, it's absolutely insane. I'm going to skip a bunch of pictures from places I went after and between these two spots. Uh, I had made it to Washington, went to Olympic uh, Rainforest a beautiful Native American beach called Shai Shai Beach, which about 75 people stayed the night in about a three mile stretch. You got to make reservations, hike three miles in kind of place. Went to Washington, a couple spots, or I mean in uh, Oregon, a couple spots there. And then ultimately headed down the one all the way down the coast of California, made it to the Redwoods, did all of that, and then came into um, Yosemite. So this is the backside of Yosemite. And uh, actually they had a, outbreak of hantavirus when I was there, which sounds eerily similar to the COVID <laughs> outbreak, but this was from rats going to the bathroom in their tents, or they have like these little temporary structures in the campgrounds. But this place is absolutely beautiful. A lot of granite, a lot of beautiful, you know, beautiful vertical edges, uh, beautiful valley floor, and just picture opportunities everywhere you go. It's a big place that takes a long time to explore. My tact for my trip was spend a couple days in all of these different parks, see what you want to go visit later, because I come to the decision that I didn't want to wait until I was older to retire. I wanted to have a series of mini retirements throughout my life so that I could experience things when I had certain capabilities and certain mindsets about things. This is my second favorite place or tied for first. And if you had to go anywhere, my recommendation would be unless you hate hotness, uh, is to go to Southern Utah into Red Rock country. It is absolutely epic beyond belief. This is Zion National Park and Zion is so cool. It's got public transportation so people don't drive through the park. So it's completely different than a lot of the other national parks. There is a hike called the Narrows, which if you wanna do it in its biggest, I think it's a 16 mile hike where you drop through 150 foot slot canyon that's about eight feet wide and you hike 16 miles in the Virgin River through insane uh, stone uh, valley. They also have the most, what I would consider the most epic hike I've ever done, which is called Angel's Landing. And Angel's Landing is a 1600 foot tall outcropping that goes out into the middle of the valley floor. And you walk on exceedingly narrow places. Uh, and there's very, very vertical drops. If you can see in this photo, that's almost straight down. I am on the edge. And when I mean on the edge, there, there's maybe a human length of distance, it seems, between the valley floor and where I'm standing. And that's 1600 feet. Funny story, I was an idiot. Uh, didn't always have the best practice when I would take out my camera gear, forgot to zip my camera bag, Went to take a hike. Went, I had stayed up at the top for 45 minutes. Got super lucky that nobody else was there. Was ready to come down. People were just starting to come up. I was going to let them have their time. I grab my bag. I pick it up. And the top flops open. And my lenses and my camera fall out of my bag. And the lenses start rolling away. And luckily, one of the ladies that was up there stopped two of them. And I stopped the other two. And avoided total disaster because I probably would have jumped after a lens, not realizing I was going off the cliff. <laughs> Anyways, Arches National Park is an amazing place. So if you go to Southern Utah, you've got Canyonlands, Arches, Bryce, Zion, you name it, amazing, amazing places. 
Um, this is the big arch at Arches National Park. Got a little bit better at shooting the astrophotography, but not quite where I you know, wanted to be by any stretch of the imagination. This is a little bit of annoying place to shoot because it gets so populated with people. It's literally like 400 people watching sunset and they all go up one at a time to get their photos taken. Um, but regardless, it's, it's worth the hike. After all that, I got back to Detroit and just kept on experimenting and playing around. This is long exposure photography, looking at motion, most specifically looking at the people mover. This image here, I, when I was in Glacier, I forgot to explain, there was this guy, I had spent about an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the same location taking a shot, but I wasn't going to spend any more time there and I was going to move on and take other photos. I met this person that had come up from the weirdest location that I didn't even know somebody was sitting and he had been there all day long. And he's the kind of person that researches shots and then visits places year after year to try to capture the one shot. So he was somebody that taught me about, do you want to take a hundred shots that are mediocre? Or do you want to take one that's good? Now I can't profess that I have the patience to do what he does, but it did impact the way that I look at how I take pictures. And in this shot here on the left, this is downtown Detroit. This building right here was designed by Minoru Yamasaki, who used to work for the firm that I work for and was the one who did the World Trade Centers or the World, uh, the, the towers. And I must have been, I don't know, shifting my camera 50 to 60 different times to try to get the perfect, the best composition I could. And these are micro shifts. This is a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit left, a little bit right, a little bit in, a little bit out, right? And this kid was like, what are you doing? And him and his family so bad wanted to be in the photo, his little sisters, one's crawling up the sculpture here and one's running around over here. And this kid, I thought he just had so much swagger. And no matter what, you know, you take this photo again, you're not going to get this because that kid's not in it. And I have a whole bunch of shots without this kid. And at the end of the day, I think he makes the photo, this little, little thing in this super huge composition, just kind of funny. This is the Renaissance Center, me playing around more with the motion of the people mover. And this shot will never be able to be taken again because it doesn't exist. And this makes me think about how sometimes absence can be absolutely beautiful. This is the old JL Hudson site that was demolished in the 90s. And for my entire time working downtown, it was basically a parking deck underneath with these stumps, kind of really eerie, stumps of steel columns coming up through the ground. This layering of this mesh fence into this part of Compuware, seeing the people mover, seeing this part of Detroit will never exist again because they're building that new building there, right? So it's something that uh, it speaks very heavily to timing. And not that you can plan everything, but if you weren't here at this time, you never see this and it's gone forever. You know, things change. So that's it. Um, thanks.